Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today we've got my man Emil Stadnaps. Emil, how are you doing today? I'm good, Prosper. How are you, mate? Fantastic. Well, today we brought you Emil. He's the founder and director of a performance company called Performance by Design. This is a team dynamics and culture building programs for both corporate and professional sports teams. And they use a model that they've developed with pro sports um, you know, around the world to help teams engage in an open, honest, and constructive um, you know, conversations about performance irrespective of the positions within the team. Yep. So this is a whole lot of team building and the model really identifies what sort of um, behaviors drive performance and it will help teams to give and also receive feedback in order to hold each other accountable for whatever chosen uh, behaviors you might be having. Yep. So if you're Beautiful. a small business person and or you're a business owner, you would know that feedback in and around your teams um, the way people are operating within your business is very, very important. And that's the reason why we've brought in the expert, Emil, to give us a bit of what he does and how he is, um, you know, hoping to create this business in and around Australia when he gets back. Now, Emil, tell us a little yeah. bit about, about your story and what brought about this uh, performance by design. Yeah, thanks, mate. So, look, I've got, I'm actually uh, currently in Toronto, Canada, where I've been living for the last 10 years. Um, my background is actually I played semi-professional Aussie rules football. Um, I didn't get drafted, so after that I started to travel the world and I actually found myself um, doing kinesiology or human movement um, at Vic Uni in Footscray. And then I did a student exchange program to a university in London, Ontario, about two hours west of Toronto, called the University of Western Ontario. Fell in love with Canadian girls, and then I found myself coming back and forwards quite a bit. And then I found that there was actually Aussie rules football here in Toronto. I played a season in 201, and then in 202, when I was coaching the national team, one of my mates said to me, Emil, why don't you come back to Canada? We'll start a team in the Aussie rules football league, and why don't you, because you're a teacher now, go and teach kids how to play footy in schools. So when you're 23, 24, you think you can do anything, don't you? So I said yes. And I got a bunch of footies from the AFL and I shipped them over and I started to go around to schools in Toronto and teaching kids how to play footy. But my first challenge possible was that I was too young to rent a car. So I actually got a hockey bag, an ice hockey bag, filled it with footies and caught public transport to schools. Me and a couple of mates, we saw about uh, 11,000 kids in eight months in 30 schools and 80 summer camps. And we built this little business just all for cash, you know, Go on the distance as young Aussies do. <laughs> and it was awesome. But anyway, after four years back in Australia, I taught at Q High. I did some TV and radio, but I never lost this passion for teaching kids how to play footy in Canada. So I reformed a company called Aussie X, and that was footy, cricket, netball in schools in Canada, helping kids make the connection that physical activity made them feel good, irrespective of their ability of sport. Uh, and then what ended up happening about three years into the business, I started to struggle because I had a bunch of, t I had a great team that were really connected. We got along great. But when it came time to have real genuine conversations about performance and, and when something didn't go great, I would, I would tend to not speak up as the boss and I would take work off of my staff and say, look, I know you made a mistake, but look, give it to me, I'll fix it. That didn't go too well for me for quite, <laughs> for quite a while. And it's a common thing that I start to see in young startups now that I mentor and, and do this other business. So in 2011, what I actually did was I connected with a guy called Jared Murphy, who was a big team dynamics expert from Australia. He left Australia at the end of 2009 to 2010 to move to England. And I connected with Jared and said, listen, Jez, I've been, I've been following your career for years and I know that you're in the UK but I want to learn more about what you've done in the past and I want to get you to, to Canada. So I did. I, I raised some money and I flew him over to work with my team and another corporate team to learn this model that you've touched on before and a really powerful model by which to have open, honest and constructive conversations about performance with any other member of the team. And it had been very successful in the pro AFL world in Australia for many years until Jez left the company and started his own thing in the UK. So ever since 2011, where I started to speak my truth and I, and I didn't hold back on what needed to be said because I had the right framework and I had the right model, I fell in love with this program. 
And I grew my company, Aussie X, to another company called X Movement. And now that company today has saw over half a million Canadian youth in Aussie rules football, netball, cricket, dance, yoga, and self-defense programs. We've built a digital platform where the kids get active inside the classroom. And that company runs itself. And the reason why it runs itself is because of this fantastic model that really empowers all team members to engage in, in, the, in the purpose of the team, speak openly and honestly about performance and really push each other around what we call the culture code of the team, the purpose of the team, the team identity, which is the value statement and the behaviours that drive performance. When you have a great framework by, like that to have conversations about performance, people start to self-manage, they start to push each other and they start to feel like they're as, as important to the team as any other member. And so I've now, um, since leaving my original company and selling out a large majority, I still own a portion of the company, but I'm not involved anymore. I built a company called X Performance, and now I've reset that company to be called Performance by Design, and I've reformed it as an Australian company with Jared Murphy, my business partner, with a global marketing firm um, called Market One, and um, my, my good mate and, and um, brother-in-law, Warren Everett, and also the famous Australian footballer, Paul Roos. So that's our, that's our foursome now. So we start, uh, you'll start to see, you know, through LinkedIn and other social media outlets, more about performance by design as early as January 2018 when I moved back to, um, to Australia in Melbourne. I understand. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for your story, first of all, and um, especially, you know, just your in-depth in, in on how you came to be and um, what this is all about. Now, yeah. just a really quick question from what you say. Canadians are world famous and world known for being very placid and very quiet people. Yeah. Would, this, would this not be... Um, uh, you know, and then we have Australians being a rowdy, <laughs> beer drinking people where yeah. obviously feedback is obviously needed because they were talking about what happened on the weekend, a couple of frothies and they don't, <laughs> they don't hold back Do you. Do you think this sort of model, um, is, is, is long overdue for, for an Australian market? Yeah, look, so the, the original company that Jared was a part of, um, was built in Australia yeah, uh, and he left it, I think, in 2009, 2010 and took it to the UK and that's when I started to connect with him. So, yeah, you're right. Look, I've always said Canadians are just polite and conservative Australians um, and the model over here is very much built around people speaking their truth and I see a lot of, of organisations, when you look at fundamentally what's, what's dysfunctional or what's not working in a team, you can genuinely grind it all the way down so at the very foundation there's usually some sort of communication breakdown and that breakdown will come from a a lack of alignment b a lack of misunderstanding of feedback c a lack of accountability and then really underlying all of that a lack of trust and trust trust comes in two forms primarily i mean there's a number of ways to build trust but the two strongest ways is to show your teammates that you're competent at what you do, like you can do your job and you can do it under pressure. Or on the other side of what we call the trust tree is that character piece, delivering on your word and doing what's best for the team over what's best for yourself. Fundamentally, that's how you can build trust at any given time, through competency and through displaying good character. So those four pillars of performance that I call it, generally, if you, if you drill down to any problem a team is having, it's usually based around one of those four pillars, if not all four. <laughs> so um, with, with that in mind, here in Canada, what I have found working with corporate teams here, because they are a little bit more conservative, they are, I would say, generally as a culture, a bit more okay with sitting back and letting the status quo roll. You know, when you look at their big brother next door, the US, they don't really sit on their hands much. They're very Buddha gate type, right? Um, but it's also, if you look at the old model of the US, it's quite authoritarian as well. But look, in my honesty, I've worked in Bangalore, I've worked in Melbourne, I've worked in um, Canada, I've worked in the States. I find that this model, when administered correctly, is really, really powerful because 
you allow everyone to find their voice and you start to tap into the infinite wisdom of the whole team because they've got the framework by which to have the conversations. And so many times in my life, especially, which is why I'm so connected to the work, I have not spoken up at certain times knowing that it would improve performance. And that's a really interesting point. A lot of people that I interview, I'll ask them, who has been in a conversation in a boardroom or in any kind of corporate setting and had information that would help performance and they've not said it? And the whole room puts their hand up and there's a big yes nod. So what our model is designed to do using the team dynamics that build high-performing sports teams, we've leveraged all that understanding, packaged it into a corporate type of model and, um, and really empower everyone to be engaged in the success of the team. So, yeah, I've found that the model really works all around the world. And look, when I went to Bangalore, you know, speaking up to your boss, <laughs> that was oh, radical. <laughs> that was, no, we're not doing it, you know. And I'm like, trust me, your boss has hired me knowing full well that you are learning how to give and receive feedback to him first and her and vice versa. And they loved it. It was, uh, Bangalore was a real cool experience for me because I don't think anything that resembles what we do had ever touched the, the, you know, the ground of India at all. <laughs> it's just not <laughs> the way they operate, right? <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Well, Emil, yeah. you touch on um, a very valid point earlier on where you said that um, your program actually helps to engage teams. How much does it cost companies or businesses if employees or teams are not fully engaged um, uh-huh. in, in their work? Yeah, look, I mean, a recent study came out of the UK showing that, uh, you know, <laughs> it was a pretty wild study actually. On average, out of an eight hour day, um, the study showed that people were working effectively for 2.53 hours a day out of their eight. So that's really about one quarter approaching, you know, one quarter of the day they're effective. So wow. you've got to lay the question, what is that costing? Any, every organisation where there's that disengagement, there's that, you know, and the millennials talk about it a lot. They want to work with purpose. They want to have an impact. Yet if you talk to the older generation, they speak about the millennials not having any grit and not, you know, won't do what you ask them to do. But I think, to, you know, today when I look at our, my clients I read the, and I look at the marketplace and I read the research, The next generation just won't work because, you know, just do your job. That sometimes is not enough for a lot of people, right? Whereas the older generation, you do your job because you do your job and that's what you're told to do and you you, you deliver on your word like that. But with this model, we're really really building the framework with the team as well. So I'll just give you a little bite size of what actually happens. One of the very first things that we do with any organisation is we – go take them through an exercise where they build what we call their team identity, their value statement. And that's created with all the leaders and all the team members in one room. And we don't settle on whatever that values statement is, you know, whether it be disciplined, committed and compassionate or inspiring, transformational and driven, whatever those values are, we usually settle on three words up to five maximum. We want it to be very quick to be able to fall upon because it becomes the foundation for all conversations about performance. But because the model and what we create with the team is designed by the team, they own it. So when it comes time to delivering feedback and asking to, and we ask each team member to step up and speak the truth, I guess, there's more buy-in because they were involved with the process of the creation. They were involved with the designing of the world, the culture, that they want to live in. And we always say, you know, performance by design has been, we call it performance by design because if you don't design the world you want to live in, you just get what you're given. Right. So we're really proactive in that approach and said, well, if you want to be known as committed, driven and transformational and you're a personal training group, for example, then what behaviours must you hold each other accountable to to be known as committed, driven and transformational? And behaviours are very cool because behaviours are very black and white. You either did it or you didn't. Whereas my opinion of committed or transformational or driven is a bit ambiguous. We could have a conversation about that and we could describe it in two different ways. But if the behaviour is you put your right hand up when you want to talk and you did it, then you need to be praised for that. And if you didn't do it, you need to be challenged for that. 
So our work is very much rooted in the behavioural sciences space and saying, well, if you behave this way and, it, and you get the performance and the results you want, you should be commended and recognised for it. And if you don't behave in the way you're connected to that culture code, you should be challenged and you should be supported to get back to it. Understandable. Thank you yeah. so much. So obviously what you're saying really goes down to, you know, the saying, I think it would have been um, Will Smith or somebody says that people support a wall that they helped to bring, to build. Beautiful. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. So that, that then gives them the ownership of, you know, they are also involved. Now, how are you not finding any sort of friction with the top brass uh, feeling that they are letting go of too much power by allowing, you know, the, 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 the lower ranking, you know, mm. team members to be part and parcel of creating the values of what, would yeah. then create a company. Don't you find a bit of resistance there? Or? Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, it's it's not for everyone, uh, but I think that the progressive thinkers and the you know the, the older generation that do hire us, um, they are the ones that realise that 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 on the ground grassroots line of defence, if you will, or whatever you want to call it, are absolutely integral. They're the people doing the work, and so if if they have a voice and they're engaged and they're, and, they're, and they're driving each other and the behaviours are wrapped around that culture code and, the, and that C-level sort of execs can understand that, then they're all for it because they start to see their bottom line rise, right, quite quickly as well because we get really quick immediate results because in one to two days of the program, they're giving and receiving feedback immediately. And, it's, and but to, get to, your, to get to your question, yes, and whenever we meet a team, and particularly leaders, obviously, who are our clients, if they push back and they don't believe that their lower-level team or middle management should have a voice, then we don't work with them. Okay. At the end of the day, I've always been mentored by Jared to say the person and the, the final decision of whether a team works with us or not is ours to make. And that's got to be based on the fact that that leader because that leader's gonna get some pretty clear and concise feedback through the process. If they, just, if they decide to do nothing with it, then it can hurt the team because they've listened and they've ignored what their team needs. So we need to back that leader in and say, yeah, if this is gonna happen, you're gonna go through this process, you're gonna get some information and some data points to change some of your behaviors. If you're not willing to do the work and change, then, don't get us in. <laughs> Don't use us because <laughs> we're going to stir the pot a bit. But right. on the other side of that friction, now I want to say on the other side of free, on the other side of um, fear is freedom. You know, that's where the gold is. So, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because you do get that pushback, but I, I can tell you 100% of the time after they've gone through the actual process on the other side of it, they have great clarity, they have a great pathway. And what ends up happening as a result is one of the big um, determinants of success for us is that the leader gets more time to work on the stuff that matters. Right. And so through the process, sometimes we kick leaders out of meetings okay. and we free up their time over the course because the data says, hey, CEO John and CEO Mary, you're useless in this meeting. <laughs> You know, we don't Take need you. <laughs> yeah, we got you. We've got this. Get out. And that's happened a couple of times, particularly one of my clients in Melbourne. We, we, we gave him back four hours a week. For you know, sitting, a, in, a, sitting in, was, a, in, a, yeah. in, a, in a meeting that could have been an email. That could have been, that he could have just got a report on and had a middle manager come and say, hey, yep, this worked, this didn't. We need you for this. Or, hey, this happened, this didn't. We don't need you at all. Fantastic. Understandable. Well, thank you so much for that insight. I mean, obviously, it is something that you work with and you encounter every single day, but other people don't yes. realize they yes. actually really need this. Now, just um, going a little bit futuristic there with you, Emil, um, yes. a few companies are outsourcing their services, you know, their workforce, and they don't all have to congregate in the one particular place. How do you then... Yeah deal with people that are, you know, hiring remotely, but still want 
that culture to prevail in and around yeah. you know their their work and how they produce or interact with their clients yeah, yeah really good question and it's something that i'm working with um with my partner warren on at the moment so we're we're starting to look at um building out some online courses that supplement our in-person facilitation. Uh, we call them we call them performance by design architects. Our facilitators are architects because we help um, design the, the culture and the workplace that they want, but they're the builders. The people in the team are the builders. They have to build the house. We'll help them design it, but they've got to build it. So they've got to do the work. And so after we run our one to two day workshop where we help them create their culture code, um, we do profiling with the team and then we engage in various forms of feedback. There's usually a three month bracket between us coming back to the team again and reviewing how did we go. We were together in March, now it's June. How much have we improved? In between March and June, we then put them onto an online training system where they meet as United Teams or in their virtual spots and we have them have conversations about the content where they get to build strong professional relationships through having conversations about performance. Hmm. So if, if people and teams are going to be virtual, then we will create virtual programs for them. We have a studio in Melbourne we're just re renovating. So we'll be able to custom create by as early as February 1st um, programs for those special teams that actually aren't there in person. And I've got to be honest, up till today, most, if not everything we do, are usually with teams that are in the one room where you can build strong professional relationships in a one on one, groups of three, small group, large group settings where you've actually, you know, you can touch your mate, you know, and give them a good rub on the head and say, well done, mate, and a tap on the bum, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Smell that. <laughs> <laughs> Smell their umpies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great stuff. Well, obviously, there's going to be a lot for us to anticipate, and you know, you've probably wet um, a lot of people's anticipation, and um, you know, are eager to know how else they can get a hold of you. Now, what's the best way people can be in touch with you so they can get the solutions that you're offering there um, in your business? Yeah, fantastic. So at the moment, right now, being November the 14th, I'm in transition, moving everything back to Australia. So I'm in a very big content creation and business setup. Although, to be honest, the business is completely set up. We can run programs tomorrow. Um, but as far as contacting me, I'm obviously on LinkedIn, so um, obviously you've got the ability to uh, write um, my name through your channels there when you go into post editing and all sort of stuff. Um, yeah. My email address is emil at performancebydesign.com.au and our website is being built at the moment. So there's no point going there. So if anyone wants to contact me, send me an email. I'll then send you our deck of information. And then what generally happens is I set up a 15-minute phone call and then I take them through a small needs analysis and determine whether or not the structure of their team and what they want actually matches what we can deliver. So the 15-minute phone call is a nice free needs analysis assessment. And at the end of it, you know, I have to make sure that the team itself actually functions as a team. You know, I've got recruiting agencies that have come to me wanting to do our work. And I said, look, I can't help you because these two recruiters are fighting for this client. I'm building relationships between these guys. These guys don't want to help each other. <laughs> That's not team dynamics. So no. that assessment, that 15 minute phone call is really key at this stage of the game because it allows them to understand, or it allows me to understand where they're at and where they want to go and it allows me to understand their structure in order to understand whether or not we can actually help them because we can't help everyone. Some teams actually don't function as a team uh, nor do they need to for performance. Understandable. Well, this has been phenomenal, man. And thank you so much for your valid uh, knowledge that you dropped on this show today. Obviously, no worries. a lot of people would not have known that if their teams are not engaged, they're actually missing out on a whole chunk of oh, active huge, time. Huge, huge costs. <laughs> 
Great. Do you have any sort of last words that you can, um, you know, impart on us? There's people that might just think it's wise to neglect not having your team pulling on all or firing on all cylinders. And uh, as we have noticed, it's costing them. You might have yeah. encountered some sort of failures that people are going through. What, what sort of last words would you do? Yeah, for sure. So one of the things of my journey, Prosper, is, and I'm, and I'm we're currently writing a book at the moment, and one of the chapters is the... Um, is the misconceptions of society and performance and all these counterintuitive things that we've been fed through media and, you know, save money and you'll get wealthy. Well, inflation rates are higher than our interest rates to save, so that's a bloody lie in itself. So there's all these, these, these contradictions that I'm finding and one of them that I always challenge people, even if they don't use our services or they're not the right client or whatever it might be, but if you want to get the most out of your staff and you aren't getting there at the moment, you're not getting what you want out of them, rather than impart feedback onto them and what you need them to do, go to them and ask them what they need you to do. So if you're a leader and you're not getting engagement from your team, go to your team and ask them, what do I need to do for you in order to be a better leader for you? It's counterintuitive because I'm trying to get you to do something, right? Yeah. But the action I take is me asking you what I can do for you. Great. So then that yeah. gives them an opportunity to say, I would want you to get off my back and I would want you yep. to give me five breaks a day so that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so yeah. that I can tap into my intuition. And um, yeah. it, it also makes them, you know, have that, uh, you did mention it uh, earlier on, the ownership of them having some sort of a decision. Yeah. To how do they want to be treated because people people are no longer a hashtag these days you know what i mean they no. really want to be treated and be known by their first name and if you would yes. ask them and go out there and say how can i be a better leader how can i be a better yeah. person in order for your job to be better then i yeah. think you would have um you know dismantled the narrative that leadership is from above you're not working with them not working yeah. at them well thank you and- yeah, I'll usually give you one last bite. One of the great questions you can ask your team is, if you were me, what would you do differently around here? Right. What would Jesus do? <laughs> what would Jesus do? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and we, call it the, we, we call it the great leader equation. All right. Listen to your staff, deliver on, of, um, implement what they need and recommend to the best of your ability, and then deliver on your word. Understand. Because really, people who are, if, who, who assesses whether you're a good leader or not the people that you lead not you right because so that's the counterintuitive party some people think that leadership is passing information down mm. well in our world it's 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 reciprocal leaders are only good as what the people they're leading say they are mm. so i wanted to ask them how can i be a better leader for you if you were me what three things would you change in our office right now understandable you can only lead people that want to be led because that's right because, because they want to not because they have to so understand exactly. uh, we get what you're trying to say well thank you Beautiful. so much for your time and your expertise and i can't wait to see you guys functioning in melbourne if you're going to have a launch party be sure to invite yes. us i'll be more <laughs> than happy to be out there and and maybe we can do a live one-on-one absolutely absolutely that. all right in the meantime thank you so much for your time and uh, safe travels back home um and yeah we'll always catch up when you're back good on you mate thanks prosper fantastic